without a doubt, one of the greatest wrestling managers of all time, and without a doubt, one of the greatest wrestling performers, entertainers in the business today, Bobby the Brain Heen. Thank you for joining us here today. Thanks for having me. How you doing? Real good. How you doing? Good. How was your trip up here? And then when you walk away from it, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> I guess my first question would be uh, how you got started in the wrestling business. Well, you know, a lot of people have started different ways. I, I was working in uh, Indianapolis at the Coliseum. And I started setting up the ring and carrying jackets and stuff like that. That's how I got involved. Were you a wrestling fan growing up? Yeah. In 1954, I went to the matches in uh, Chicago, Marigold Arena, and I uh, I was amazed at what a guy could do. He told people to be quiet, they made noise. You tell them to make noise, they'd be quiet. You could control anybody. So you saw this and you said, oh, that was something that I want to do. Yeah, yeah, something to mess with the people. Now, when you first got into the business, you were basically a wrestler, right? Before no. managing, you, you, manager. You came right off the bat and you wanted to manage. Yeah. Did you ever want to? go into the ring and actively wrestle? Or? Sure. Who are some, go ahead. The reason, the reason I, I started as a manager because I was only 180 pounds. But I figured it out years ago. You manage as a wrestler and you wrestle as a manager. Very simple. All right. Very simple. When you're outside, you have to register and react like your man is. When you're in the ring, you have to be a coward. That's all you have to do. It works. But not many people know how to do that now. There's no emphasis on managers anymore. Unless because everybody to. wants the TNA. Right. Yeah. And with women, there's no payoff. Because you can't beat them up. You can't have a cage match. You can't hurt them. You can't do anything to them. So you look good. Like your honeymoon. Until the lights go off. <laughs> <laughs> how was the decision made to go from wrestling to managing? I mean, basically... Something well, I didn't. I went from managing to wrestling. That's true. That's true. So it was easy. More money. Now, the reason I the reason I wanted to manage and then go into wrestling was because I knew that I could work, and I knew that they'd have to pay me to do it. That's where the money was. What are some of the early territories that you worked? Pardon? Some of the early uh, territories that you worked. Uh, Indianapolis. I was the first manager uh, ever in the uh, in St. Louis in the NWA. Right. I worked Kansas City. I worked uh, Minneapolis. I worked um, a little bit in Detroit. I worked in uh, Canada for the Bear Man up in Ontario. I uh, worked for the WWF. I worked for WCW. I worked for NWA in 1979. Um, you also worked for uh, Georgia, I believe, when Ollie was there. Yeah. Yeah. I worked for Paul Bosch in Houston. Great guy. Best playoff guy in the business. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Good man. What are your uh, early memories of working for uh, Georgia with Ollie Anderson as Booker? How was Ollie? Oh, horrible. Horrible. No respect for humans. Everybody says that he's a miserable guy. Yeah. Yeah. He, he's, he's the kind of a guy that has a size 10 foot but has a size 9 shoe. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing makes him happy. Now, early on, who did you travel with the most in the, in the business? Uh, Blackjack Lanza, uh, Baron Von Raschke, um, Pepper Gomez, uh, Wilbur Snyder, myself. Do you have any good road stories from those guys? Or? Yeah, well, they're all good. You know, they're, you know, you, same thing. You drive 200 miles and then you come back 200 miles with a case of beer and <laughs> swim gyms. It's, it's fun. Right. Um, not a whole lot of money in those days, but you didn't care because you wanted to do it. Right. You were stupid. You should have realized they're making money off me. Pay me now. We didn't know then. Who are some of the guys responsible for taking you under the wing and teaching the ropes, the psychology of the business? And no one. Uh, Ray Stevens. Ray Stevens? Yeah, Ray, uh, Ray talked to me a lot. Other than that, all you had to do was open your eyes and see what was right and wrong to do. You could tell the guys that were over and guys that weren't over. And guys that are always underneath will always be underneath. I told my wife one day, we had an argument. I said, if you could have done any better, you would have. And that's the simple. If guys want to be champion, they'll get there. If they don't, they won't. A lot of guys think, I can work. I know how to buy trunks. I know how to buy boots. That don't mean you can put asses in a seat. That's what a worker is. A lot of guys say, Hogan can't work anymore. He can still put asses in a seat. That's a worker. That's true. That's what it's yeah. all about, though. There's no doubt about that. 
It all boils down to money. If you're in this business for anything more than money, you're a fool. Monsoon told me that. We're going to talk about Grohl. i got a lot of sure. questions regarding him. Do you have any good uh, road stories with uh, Crusher or the Bruiser? Or any stories on that? No, one? never traveled with him. How were they to work with? Uh, in the ring? Easy. Easy. Very easy. Crusher was a very, 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 very good guy. What were they like outside the ring? Um, Crusher was... Uh, he went home to his family. Didn't hang around much with anybody. Didn't... Uh, socialize that much. Everybody went home in those days. You were on the road all the time, so you didn't hang around that much. And when you went back to the hotel, you went to bed. Right. Yeah. Now, you mentioned Ray Stevens earlier. A lot of people we've done interviews with in the past say that Ray's probably one of the greatest workers of all time. Yes. No doubt about that. What is your opinion of Ray, and what was he like outside the ring, too? Oh, Ray was fun. He was more fun outside the ring. <laughs> you didn't know what he was going to do. But he always made you laugh. Like you told me, he said... Um, his wife was about 10 years older than him, and she was a wrestler. And he said, I used to have her on knees twice a week begging. I said, did you hit her? He said, no, she was telling me to come out from under the bed and fight like a man. <laughs> I said, Ray, how old were you when you first had your first lady? Right. He said, six. <laughs> I said, where'd you take her? He said, I don't know, I was too drunk to remember. <laughs> That's the kind of a guy Ray Stevens was. Right. Everything was fun. And really, I learned a lot from him. Simply that if you you, you got to have fun what you do. you got to have fun. I don't care how much money you make. If you don't have fun, it don't mean nothing. It doesn't mean a thing. What was it like working with, uh, I guess, Vern Gagne and the AWA back in the early... Oh, Vern was fun. He was, uh, he was, uh, he was strict. He, uh... It was funny. He, he made you do things other people didn't want to do, like be on time and work. <laughs> and be conscientious. I mean, a lot of guys didn't want to do that. A lot of guys wanted to get there when they felt like it. No, Vern was easy, as long as you worked hard. That's all. He paid you good. I have no trouble with Vern. Memories of working uh, with Nick Bockwickle and managing him. Oh, Nick was fun. Nick was always, you'd ask Nick a question, he'd tell you how to build a watch. <laughs> ask him what time it was. Nick, uh, Nick had, when they were in a car, and Nick is talking about the... Um, a paradox. So he says to Ray now, you know what a paradox is? I said, yeah, it's two long dogs. <laughs> Ray said, no, no, it's two places where you put a boat. <laughs> the next day, Nick says, have you guys read about the egg deficit in Guam? Ray says, hey, asshole, we're still working on paradox. <laughs> But Nick we used to like to use big words. But right. that's fine. Nick was uh, Nick cared about the business. He cared about himself. Right. And um, he always wanted to look good. And he was a professional. Memories back then on uh, Hogan and the AWA. Oh, Hogan was uh, phenomenal. When he came into the AWA, Ver Vern wanted him to be a heel. So he put him with a horrible human being, um, Johnny Valiant. Um... This guy couldn't get over turning on a light. <laughs> and I don't care how many people Hogan beat, people wanted him to be a baby face. They loved him. And that's the way it went. Did you know that he was going to be a huge star in the business? Oh, yeah. I saw him in 79 in Georgia. I walked in the dressing room, he was this huge. and I just saw, this, this kid's got it. He's one of those guys that just had it. Did, um, do you think that Vern pushed his son too hard at any time, like Greg Anya? Didn't push him enough. Should have pushed him off the cliff. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think Vern pushed himself too hard? How hard could he have pushed him? He owned the territory, yeah. owned the belt. <laughs> I mean, owned the... I mean... Right. How else could he have pushed himself? Could have grown hair. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think went wrong with the AWA? as far as the business standpoint? AWA tried to fight a promotion that couldn't, that they didn't know how to fight. Vince was um, New York mentality, uh, showbiz. Vern was wrestling, wool trunks, grab an ankle, hold it. Vince was anything goes. You couldn't keep up with it. The world wanted to go a different direction. And uh, Vern and a lot of promoters couldn't keep up with it. They didn't know how to do it. Right. 
That's why I left. I was there, and I, I thought, we're going nowhere here. AWA to me always meant Alzheimer's Wrestling Association or <laughs> all the world's assholes. <laughs> So basically, he didn't have the the concept, and he couldn't see into the future. He stayed. No with one us. did, except Vince. No one did. Eddie Graham, Nick Gulas, name them. Stu Hart. Nobody did. They're all wrestlers. They had no idea what showbiz was. Right. Now you talked also about Eddie Graham from Florida and stuff like that. Did you ever work for him? A couple times. What was that like? Oh, it was easy. I just went down there to work uh, to run off my trip for vacation. Right. But I never went to the territory to work as a wrestler. So I never had anything to do with Eddie. But Eddie was a, what I knew from people that worked there, he was a, a disciplinarian. He wanted you to do the finish a certain way. He had right. long finishes, like 20 minutes. And um, he ran his territory strict. And um, that was probably the way to run it. Because the guys are flakes. Guys are flakes because of the wrestling business makes them that way. They don't give us any insurance, no benefits, or anything. So every time we get a chance to grab on some money or bite somebody, we take it. They made us this way. But it's our own fault, too. If we didn't want it, we can go get another job. Love the business. Well, we don't want to get up in the morning and work. Right. That's what it is. We don't want to work at Sears and move refrigerators. Huh. <laughs> So you get up and try to work with a guy that can't work. How was too hard to work for? Up in Canada? Never worked for him. Never? No, he was, uh, I imagine it would have been hell. Yeah, the traveling and stuff the, like that. Oh, the mentality of the, the whole territory and him, you know. Everything is, eh. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, I like Stu, I like Helen, I like Brett. But to be up there in Canada, you know, when you, you ever go to Canada? Yeah, we were there. We were at Brett. We were when you land on the plane, they tell you to sit your watch back to 1945. <laughs> No, there's nothing there. It's different. Now, how did you wind up going to the World Wrestling Federation in the early 80s? Hogan. Hogan brought you in? Yeah. Hogan called me. I was in Minneapolis. I got him into uh, AWA. And he called me. I went to Japan. And when I got back, he, he called me a couple times wanted me to go. But AWA was easy. You work f three or four days a week, and you made good money. You didn't have to work every day. I didn't want to work every day. I had a wife and a kid, and I didn't want to work every day. I just don't like traveling and working every day. Right. And uh, he t told me to go call Vince, and he put together a deal, and Vince offered me three times what I was making at the AWA. So I had to go for it. Now, were you at, uh, with Vern when Mr. Sado and Ken Patera got into trouble? Mm hmm What was the vibe in the locker room when that all happened? Nothing. Nothing, just boys being the boys? Another night out. Yeah. That's all. Somebody got caught. What were your initial thoughts when you first met Vince? First time I met Vince was uh, when they were promoting the uh, Anoki uh, Muhammad Ali thing. And Nick and I, uh, Bachwinkle and I, went to Chicago from Omaha, and they had an exhibition where Muhammad Ali was going to box, like uh, Buddy Wolf and Kenny J and a couple of guys. And we went up to dinner, uh, breakfast, and walked up to Vince's table, introduced ourselves, and he went, <laughs> Okay. But then when I went there to work for him, couldn't be nicer. I mean, man's a genius. How did Vince change as uh, his company grew? Um, when you're there, you can't tell. So since I've been gone, I can see where it's been. It's grown bigger. But I don't know what he's like because I hasn't been around him. But while I was there. He was always easy to talk to. He always said, here's my phone number. 24 hours a day, call me. You can ask me anything. A lot of guys don't like him. A lot of guys do. He's never been bad to me. So you always got along with him? Yeah, and no problem. What are your, some of your early uh, memories of managing? I guess you managed John Studd, Ken Batera, some of the, when you first came in. Uh, Studd, was, uh, Studd was a very nice man. Should have never been in the business. He was too nice to be in the business. Right. Too nice to be a heel. And Patera should have been a heel all his life. Because <laughs> he was an athlete, you know, and he was pampered his whole life and world's strongest man. And he didn't take, I mean, he would he could pull over on the road for a ticket, like going 35 and a 30. He said, come on, Barney, give me the ticket, asshole. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're not going to get off on stuff like that. But Seth would always sign autographs and was very nice to people. And was a... Uh... Hogan different to work with in the WF than he was in AWA because of, you know, 
No. Bigger star? No. He never changed. He, he, he wasn't that way. A lot of guys don't like him because they didn't get to work with Hogan. The reason they didn't get to work with Hogan is because they couldn't draw money with Hogan. And you guys that are sitting home right now and are saying, Hogan screwed me. If you could have drawn money, you'd have been there. If you could have been the worst human being on war in, in, in life, you'd have been there to draw money. The only reason you didn't work with Hogan was you couldn't draw money. That's simple. You'd, he'd work with a grape if he could draw money. <laughs> That's simple. Was there any kind of rivalries between any of the managers? Because you were there at the time, Lou Albano, Jimmy Hart. Like I don't know. I never talked to none of them. I never discussed uh, my career with them. I never discussed money, uh, days off, pay, or anything. I, what you do is your business. What I do is mine. I found out a long time ago, if I find out that I got a thousand dollars last night and you got two thousand, I'm going to be mad. So I don't want to know what you make. Right. Because, and then if I find out, if they find out that I got two and they got one, they're not going to give them more. They're going to take from me to make them happy. So I never tell anybody what I made. All right. Memories of uh, Jimmy Snooker. Shh. Huh. Uh, Jimmy was a uh, he was good. He was a, he was a hell of an athlete, boy. He played uh, rugby, I think, over in Fiji or whatever they do over there. I guess that's just for lunch. But uh, <laughs> I mean, I don't know how they live over there, but they come out of trees and they jump from place to place and. Hell of an athlete. Hell of an athlete, brother. <laughs> Thoughts on uh, Roddy Piper? Piper is very talented. I remember Roddy when he was in uh, coming out of Winnipeg, Canada, coming to Minneapolis to wrestle. He was about 190 pounds. And you had big guys then. You had, you had Mosca, you had uh, Crusher, you had Larry Hennig. And they'd always ask the guys, you know, they wouldn't ask them, but they would say, who'd you work with last time? So you didn't follow up. Right. Piper didn't care. He'd wrestle anybody. He just wanted the experience. I mean, I could see he was going to be good because he had a good mouth. He could talk. Good talk. Talking will always get you better. Will help you more than your body or your ability. It always does. Speaking of talking, you're probably one of the greatest guys on the mic and very quick-witted. Who taught you basically how to talk in front of the mic, or is it something that you've always had natural talent? It's so simple. Right now, I'm happy. Can you hear I'm slurring on my words a bit? I have TMJ. You know what that is? No. It, it's a nerve. It goes down to your jaw, into your ear, into your neck. And it's very hard to speak sometimes. It happens, and I don't know what, what causes it, but I have to go have a mouth replacement, some gimmick done. Right. Who knows, doctors? They don't want to tell you. <laughs> um, I learned how to talk shaving. Every day you shave your face. Be a German. Be an Indian. Be a heel. Be a baby face. Be whatever you want to be. But when you shave, you always see yourself like the people see you. Do an interview. That's how I did interviews. I taught myself to do interviews. Basically just looking and doing facial expressions. Just expression. looking in the mirror. That's all. And everybody down does the same interview. He's going down. Whoa, that will make you... Martha, well the car and the kids. Let's go see this. <laughs> <laughs> no. They all use cliches. No one is... No one is creative anymore and knows how to get over it. They think yelling and screaming, they think wearing sunglasses and a beard and long hair. Why dress like the guy that buys tickets? That's what you're doing. If you were to give advice to guys that are in the business today, what would you tell them? Put a 38 to the roof of your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ever make any money in this. Today's it's business. over. Business is over. Wrestling's over. Why do you say that? Because there's no more, uh, the magic is over. We've now taught the you fans. It's been how, exposed too much? We've now taught the fans how we do tricks. It's over. Grab what we can right now. Suck what we can. Like, they're talking about the terrorists. You don't swat termites or, or mosquitoes. Kill the swamp. We've killed the swamp. We've showed the people how we do the tricks. No more. If, if Houdini or Blackstone showed everybody how these are tricks, they couldn't draw a house next time. You don't think the business could be retaught? It's over. Everyone knows it's not real. You ever been in a fight? In a real fight? Yeah. Once, yeah. Once in my life. 30 seconds the most. Right. <laughs> no. Hit again, that's one time, it's over. You're only as tough as your eyes and your balls. Hmm. That's it. It's all entertainment.
and uh, they don't know how to entertain anymore. Because there's people in the business now that aren't from the business. Are you shocked at the openness of the business? I mean, nah. Because nah. it's really changed, I mean. Yeah. I try to defend it for a while, but you can't anymore because the people you have in it that were wrestlers mm -hmm. wouldn't defend it because their work was so bad. I mean, you don't hit a guy and do this. But They've never been in a fight. I mean, they, they look stupid. And promotion did that. They used guys that would work for nothing. And they compensated, uh, they, they retarded their own product. That's what they did. Um, you were there for the whole WrestleMania, uh, WrestleMania 3 and all that stuff. What do you think about WrestleMania 3 and the uh, success? Of I thought that was great, just to see that many people there. And Andre, that was his last run, and uh, he knew it. And that's why he uh, wanted to do that with Hogan. Right. And it was just, he knew we couldn't make any more money after that. He just couldn't get around anymore. Did you re realize that the WF was going to be as big as it was going to get? Or did you, you know? When it first started, I knew that Vince was going to do something different. And then when I could see it, just, the, the, just different things he did that nobody else did. I said, this, this is the way to go. That's why I went with it. MTV and stuff like that. Oh, like yeah. Entertainment getting on. No one else did that. No one else wanted to associate anybody with anything like that. But that was the way to go. See, we, we should have smartened up the television people and the producers and directors. No, we smartened up the fans. Thoughts on managing and working with uh, Paul Orner, Mr. Wonderful. You guys were great together, so. Paul was a very intense guy. He, he loved what he did, and he, he cared about how he looked. And he really was concerned about his image. And he, he always tried to make himself better. That's what I liked about him. He, when an interview came, what are we going to talk about? How many minutes we got? Are you going to, how much are you going to take? I said, well, I'll take 30. I'll open it at 15. I'll, give me 10 at the end. Then I'll have a minute and a half. He was always, he was always a professional. I liked him. I, 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 I called me the other day. And he's, uh, he's got some bad neck problems now and arm problems. But uh, he's going to be all right. You talked briefly about Andre the Giant. What was he like outside the ring? You've heard various. Oh, he hated people. People always come up to him and say, how tall are you? How much you weigh? How big is your hands? Oh, he was just rude. He was just... He was just tired of it, probably. Oh, yeah. And he knew he only had so long to live because they told me he had the giant disease, that, which he would grow, but his organs wouldn't. So, um... He had, he had a lot of problems. Now, you also wrestled a couple times for, like, even Sal Bellarmo and stuff like that. How did that come up? Vince said, I just basically want to... They just booked it. You just do what you're told. Right. Yeah. That's all. We talked briefly about it uh, a couple seconds ago. How has kayfabe changed from now? I mean, from then to now, as far as you know, the openness of the business. Well, there is no kayfabe. No, there is none. I mean, in the sixties when I started, you know, the heels rode in one car, baby fits rode another. You never, right? You never did that. You never talked to anybody in a restaurant or. People always say, I saw, I don't remember the other guy, I saw this guy and that guy wrestled and they went to the bar and had a beer together. Nah, didn't happen as much as people think. It really didn't. Uh, it probably did, but not like everybody says. Right. People really, prote the boys really protect the business because your mentality was, you can't let them know it's fake or they won't buy tickets and that's what feeds us. So that's what it was. And uh, stuntmen didn't show you how to do stunts. You know, the funny thing about the business is, you know, we've never said it was real. You people said it was fake. Right? Right. At the beginning of Roseanne's show, does Tom Arnold come out and say, I'm not really married to her? Does Carson come out and say, Ed McMahon, only he's here for a half hour a night? They never tell anybody what it is. It's a show. It was a television show. That's all it was. That's all it was. What was your reaction to the locker room when, uh, I guess, Iron Sheik and Jim Duggan got caught together in the car? Because they were feuding at the time and stuff like that. And was, eh, I mean, it had to happen. Probably happened years, a hundred times before that. Yeah, just never like, brought up because WWF was getting popular then. That's why it was. Years ago, they let you go. The cops would let you go. Right. That's what it was. You were popular. Who were some of the earlier guys that you managed also in the WF? Um, I managed the missing link. I remember that. I'm trying not to. <laughs> <laughs> what was he like outside the ring, Dewey? 
he came up to me the first night. He says, what time is your flight tomorrow? I said, around 10. He said, mine's around 11. He said, if you get there a quarter of 10, that's fine. I said, for what? He said, to get my boarding pass. I said, why can't you get it? He said, well, my gimmick, I don't talk. I said, well, you're going to have to now. Because <laughs> I'm going to manage you 20 minutes a night if you go that long. I said, I'm not paid to take care of you on the road. Right. He said, well, I got the face and the hair. I said, this is New York. <laughs> They'll just think you have a bad hairdo. Right. They won't care. You'll blend in. But no, I was never anybody's manager. I never wanted to do that. I never wanted to be responsible for someone's life. Or mm. That's why I never wanted to be a booker or a promoter. I don't want to make sure people make a living. I don't have enough time making myself a living. <laughs> don't worry about making a bunch of crybabies a living. Right. Being, being a manager, if you were a real manager, it would be like working at a daycare center all day with adults. <laughs> Yeah. I guess the only shoot manager would be Paul Ellery. Yeah, look how good he's doing. All right. So, so you and what did he ever do? What did he ever do? Yeah. Really? What did he ever do? Couldn't work. Nice guy. Couldn't draw you a dime. He just slid there with the Wall Street Express. Right. That was it. Did you have any other roles besides managing? Obviously, not the boys, but behind the scenes as far as... Well, I was with WWF. I used to produce the interviews. Uh, myself, Jack Lanza, and uh, George Steele. I produced uh, a big portion of them. I'd you know, tell them what to say. They knew what to say, but I would watch it, make sure it came across okay. And a lot of guys were very easy to work with. Some guys, I was a warrior, you couldn't produce him. <laughs> You know why? He oh. was too good for the business. He was too smart. As far as what? Where is he now? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's that's the truth. That's, right. the, that's the way it is. Who were some of the other guys that were difficult to work with? Uh, Albano wasn't easy to produce. You know, rubber bands are too tight. <laughs> You'll see it today, actually. <laughs> yeah, um, Piper wanted to do his own thing. Right. Some guys want to do their own thing. I don't mind that. Did Vince allow that, or did he say, no, you got to stick? No, no. Vince, Vince was cool. Vince knew. It's not like we're a team. Everybody plays the same. It, it can't be that way. There are stars, and there aren't stars, and some people have to be treated differently to make a business run. And he knew how to treat everybody differently, and it worked. How did you get into the announcing with uh, Gorilla Monsoon? Uh, Jesse... Went and did that movie with uh, Arnold. Okay, Predator. And uh, he was doing prime time then. So then uh, Vince asked me if I would want to do that. I said, sure. So when I did that, and then I did The Garden, uh, Madison Square Garden. Right. And um, then I did Challenge, and Jesse was he's a big movie star then. So I, I walked into it. How was um, how's it work? That's what happened to me at WCW, too. They didn't like Jesse there because him and Hogan have a, a problem. Right. Um, Jesse has a bigger problem than Hogan does. What is the real story between the two? I mean, that's hard. I think, first of all, Jesse always wanted to be superstar Billy Graham. And then Graham disappeared. And then in Minneapolis, then Hogan came in. And Jesse was jealous of Hogan. That's what it was. Jesse probably has more sleepless nights worrying about Hogan than he does the state of Minnesota. <laughs> Hogan is never worried about Jesse. And that's what it is, I think. Jesse is jealous of Hogan. And he carried over there. Jesse had, was a great talker, had strange looking outfits, but when the bell rang, it was over. Couldn't work. <laughs> no. No. No, no, disgrace, uh, no, no disgrace to that, because I can't be a governor of a state, but he couldn't work. But he could work, because he could draw people. But he couldn't take bumps, and he couldn't entertain you physically in the ring. Right. That's what I'm saying. He must be good at politics, because he's not doing that, so. Well, a lot of people can do that, you know. A lot of people are, there's a lot of good preachers out there, too. Exactly. You know, exactly. I mean. Look at Tammy and uh, Jimmy. <laughs> I'd like them for neighbors. Yeah. <laughs> I would. Would it be fun looking over the fence? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. 
Grill Monsoon, how did you get along with him behind the scenes? Oh, one of the best friends I've ever had in my life. Just an honest, decent man. I mean, it meant no harm to anyone. But he was honest with you. He'd tell you if there was something wrong. He'd tell you if you were the shits or weren't. But he was just a, a good, good man. Some of the skits you did on primetime were just hilarious. I mean, never rehearsed anything. All ad lib. We, we, we would sit down. What are we going to do tonight? This is the Halloween show. Let's do this and that. That's how it went. And not that we were that good. We just were that good with each other. Right. And it really was fun. It was fun. That, that was the most thing about it. It was fun. It wasn't a job. I look forward to going to be with him. Yeah. Any of the skits stand out the most? I mean, you guys went to Vegas one time. And... I remember Halloween when we did, where Monsoon wore a gorilla mask the whole time and had a tux on and right. gorilla hands. <laughs> At the end of the show, we noticed that a cameraman was about the same size as him. So I said, Gino, switch with the guy. So the cameraman came and sat down, put the mask on, put Gino's tux on, <laughs> had the hands. Right. And as we're wrapping up the show, Monsoon walks in with his bag and everything. He says, I'm sorry I'm late. <laughs> <laughs> Who have I been with for two hours? Right. But just stuff like that we used to do. And he was, he was the best. I remember he went to the movie set. And uh, I think it was the Western movie <laughs> he set. He blew up with the dynamite. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Monsoon. That took us uh, two days in old Tucson. Yeah, it was great. He was mad because I was doing a Super Bowl. He wanted to watch the game. Right. He didn't want to be there doing that. Right. Did anything ever go wrong with the skits? I mean, when you went to Vegas with the live people? Oh, nah. Everything was... Nothing. It didn't matter. See, when you're the brain, that's the best gimmick in the world because people expect you to be stupid. So no matter what you do, if it screws up, it works. If it work, if it if it works fine, it works. You can't fail being the brain if you don't care. A lot of guys care about their image. How am I going to look? Like Monsoon said, if you're in this for anything more than money, you're a fool. Who are the Who are the Rosati sisters? They were three uh, ladies from upstate New York. They were friends of Vince McMahon's, and he liked them. And they they were just real fans. They were really really nice people. Yeah. When uh, they did uh, Terry Taylor and Brooklyn Bar, they did the angle in the studio where he slammed them through the thing. Do you think they could have utilized that show for more angles, like live? Because that seemed to come off all right. Is that I barely remember that. Uh, that thing with Terry Taylor and me, um, that was an embarrassment. I, I did it because Vince wanted me to, but I mean, he wasn't a top guy. He was never going to draw you money. He was just an underneath guy. So he made him a rooster. So, a brawler, you could have done better with him if he had been smarter. He was from Brooklyn, but he didn't know how to be a brawler. I took him to Hershey Park Arena, had him lay underneath the um, the boilers and get dirty. He went outside and rubbed dirt on himself. I said, "Not that kind of dirt. You got to have building dirt. Right. <laughs> you got to look like, you know, he he he'd wash his shirt." Nobody washes your shirt. You're a brawler. So, that's what I'm saying. Some guys are main event. Some guys aren't. You know, the difference between a limo driver and a cab driver. What's that? Limo driver has a suit. <laughs> it's the only difference. Getting back to Terry Taylor, do you think that Vince put him into that gimmick to, as a, you know, as a dig because he was booking for uh, Phil Watts? And, and oh, I don't think Terry Taylor was ever a problem where anybody had a punish him for what he did. He was so minute, it was unbelievable. Right. I'm not, he's not a real, I'm not a real fan of his. No, I don't like him. <laughs> Any specific reasons, or? Yeah, he's not, a, he's not a truthful guy. He lied to me at WCW, and he, uh, he, he, he lied to me. I don't trust people that don't lie to me. Sorry. Do you want to talk about it, or as far as uh, No, it, it wasn't even that important. It was okay. just uh, trivial little kid shit. Right. And that's why he's where he's at. What do you attribute uh, the chemistry between you and Gorilla? You guys work great together. I mean. uh, comedy. I think we both like to laugh, and we both had a good time with each other, and we both realized that wrestling is not it's, it's not its not a cure for cancer. It's not a heart transplant. It's entertainment. Have fun with it. If you're that serious about anything, go do something else. Right. We just had fun doing it.
Did you enjoy announcing or managing better? Oh, announcing. announcing. You don't get touched. No one picks you up. All right. Yeah. Did um, you, like, make a lot more money, like, with your guys working with Hogan? Did you made it, was it that much of a difference? Sure. You always made more when you worked in the main event. And when your man was uh, involved in an angle with Hogan or something, sure, you made a lot of money. That's why with the uh, the Red Roosters of this world, there's, it, I, I was just doing that to get TV time. You're not going to make him money with those guys. And they're going to make him money. Would you pay to see him? Huh. I guess not. No. Some of the angles that you've been involved with, like uh, the cutting of Andre's hair and stuff like that, what are, what are some of the ones that stick out the most to you? Oh, that was fun because John Studd used to carry the hair in the bag for right. over a year. Finally, Gene Oakland said one day, he said, I think it's getting gray. <laughs> <laughs> he had it so long in the bag it was getting gray. I remember a funny Andre story. Andre used to like to have a few drinks in the morning. Right. So um, he got on a plane one day. And in first class, you can pull the armrest up and move it. So he's trying to pull that up. So the stewardess comes by and she says, uh, anything I can get you? It's all Andre wanted to drink. So he says, screwdriver. <laughs> About ten minutes later, she comes up and hands him a screwdriver. <laughs> <laughs> so Andre says to her, what would you have brought me if I'd have said Bloody Mary? <laughs> So I said, can I talk to you for a minute? So I called her into the galley. Right. I said, when a guy gets on the plane and he's seven foot five and he's 550 pounds and he's smashed, <laughs> don't bring him tools. <laughs> it's simple. Yeah. What if you want a buzz saw <laughs> or a jackhammer? <laughs> no. Do you have any good stories about you and Gino, such as bloopers or anything? No, because we let him go. Just... They were just... We, we would mess up so many times on things, and we just let it go because he laughed and I laughed. And right. I would say, he would say, what, the, what, what, what are you doing? Stop that. And we just had fun. It was just, it was the best time in my 40 years in the business hmm. with him. How did the idea come about for the Bobby Heenan show? Vince came up with it. And uh, Vince had a guy that was supposed to go on okay things with USA Network. And that's why I only ran four shows, I think. Because USA said, we have a contract for two hours of wrestling, not an hour and a half, not a half hour Bobby Heenan show. Well, it's still wrestling, but they didn't think of it that way. So that was in the contract, you had, a, you had two hours of wrestling, so that's why they cut it off. Right. But you know, I, I, I think it would have been fun to keep, uh, continue. I think, it could, I think it would work now. It was great stuff. It yeah, if, great stuff. but it was it was hard to do because there was no audience and you couldn't time your laughs. Right. But the people were so they were they were real. They they were real. They found them on the street. They did, were. Where did Jameson come from? He's an actor. He's uh he's around New York and Vince liked the guy for some reason. And, I mean, he's a nice man. And he's a a good actor. What he, he did some commercials for different things, and he's a good guy. I knew you guys had like the porno actor song one time. Rosati Sisters, I believe, were on one of the shows. The Only Cats. Yeah, the Only Cats. The, 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 the um, <laughs> porno queen we had was uh, Heather Hunter. Heather Hunter. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, but you know she she did, wasn't appealing looking to me. She was small and she did. She wasn't sexy. Sexy to me is sexy. Sexy isn't having everything hang out of your clothes and big lips and a bunch of aqua velvet on. <laughs> that don't work. She's still in the biz. Is she? She's still making. Great. Well, there's a lot of guys at 4 o'clock in the morning still pulling into those places, too. <laughs> wearing galoshes. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Thoughts on managing Rick Rude? Rude was hard to manage. Rude didn't want a manager. He didn't want me. He thought he could get over without me. Which was fine. I don't have a problem with that. And he he always thought I was trying to steal his heat. Mm. Never never did that. Vince put me with him because of the introduction, ladies and gentlemen, and we would do the Chip and Dale thing, and that was it. And uh, obviously, Vince felt that Rude couldn't do it alone, or he wouldn't have put him with me. Other than that, Rude was just a business partner to me. That was all. 
Thoughts on your Weasel Suit matches with uh, Ultimate Warrior, and how hard was it to work with him? <laughs> the Weasel Suit matches with Great Gagne were great. With the Ultimate Warrior, it was hard to work on angle with him because he didn't know how to work. He didn't understand the business. Oh, the story. Andre used to like to be clotheslined, but he wanted to step out about a foot from the ropes. So when you hit him, he could take a step back and tie himself. Right. Well, the warrior would come like 200 miles an hour and just hit him as hard as he could, which would never bother Andre. I he would hear Andre go, hmm. I knew something was going to happen down the road. Huh. Next night, same spot. Mmm. <laughs> Third night, here comes the warrior. 200 miles an hour. Just as he gets there, Andre goes, puts the hand up, which is like this. Right. Stops him cold, cracks the paint. He grabs the rope, almost goes down, doesn't know where he's at. Next night, here he comes. Do -do, do -do, do -do. <laughs> Bing. And Andre looks down at me and yells, He's learning. <laughs> That's how to teach him. That's, great. That's how to teach him. Because I'll tell you something. If Andre did not want you to have a good match, <laughs> forget it. There's right. You could do it. There's nothing you could do to him. <coughs> We've heard that before. I think Jake said that. Yeah. Every time he went to pick him up, Andre would step on his hair. Oh, I told you, Andre. <laughs> stand on his hair and pick him up. <laughs> I would tell Andrew, Andrew used to like to stand on you too. I would tell him to hop. <laughs> Unbelievable. Oh yeah, he could do every one. He used to like to sit on the Iron Sheik. When the Sheik's head faced that way, he would sit this way on him and take his arms and roll him like a boat. Unbelievable. Just hated the Sheik. Hated him. Because he pushed people around and took advantage of people in the ring. And that's why Andrew didn't like. You know. A lot of guys in the old days were weekend wrestlers. They had jobs, and they would come on TV, and they weren't any good. They shouldn't have been there. Right. So some guys would hurt them. Well, that's not going to help you in your match. It's not going to help you when this guy punch you and throw you around either. So what you do is you take him down, you get holes, you get yourself over. You work with the people, you get the announcer, you kill six minutes. Forget him. A lot of guys would go out there and want to give those guys spots. Right. You can't. They can't do them. Then they get mad at them when they mess them up and they beat the hell out of the guys. These guys are working for the weekend. They, they have a job during the week. They have to feed their families. People never cared about that. When Ric Flair came into the company, uh, whose idea was it to put you with Ric Flair? Because a lot of people said, you know, why did they put Bobby with Ric Flair? Ric Flair's a great talker. And do you think it was, you know... So the reason they put me with Ric Flair is because Ric Flair couldn't come in to talk yet. He wasn't free of his contract. Okay, that's right. You guys did the vignettes first. So I the sent the, they sent the belt first. Right. That was it. Thoughts on managing Ric Flair? Great. Great. Fun guy. I guess it seemed eventually you faded out of the Flair. And, uh, actually you well, I had a bad neck. I had to broke my neck in 83 in Japan. And it constantly kept getting worse. That's why I quit managing. I just couldn't do it anymore. I was in too much pain. And I just wanted to... It was no more fun. I've done it all. Did I mean, there was, there was nothing else to do. I've been to, I've been to all my gas station in Japan. So what's left? All right. Yeah. Thoughts on Kurt Henning? Kurt's a great athlete. Good kid. I know his dad and mom very well, and he's a he's a talent. He um, he's misunderstood a lot by people. They think he's, uh, a lot of promotions think he's uh, trying to stick it up their butt all the time. He's just trying to get, everybody's trying to get his money. That's all. All right. What are some of the, I guess, favorite wrestlers that you like to work with and work spots out with, or and who are some of the least favorite wrestlers that you like? You, know? you mean in the ring? In the ring. Oh, I enjoyed working with Red Bastine, uh, Pepper Gomez, um, the High Flyers, Brunzel and Ganya. Yeah. Um... I didn't like working with the Warrior because he had no respect for wrestlers. He was just a, a muscle-bound uh, maitre d' at some titty bar. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. I don't know. I mean, he has no wrestling ability. He never thought about learning how to craft. He thought he'd 
paint on and hang different things off his boots and wear feathers or something. I don't know. Huh. But you, you, I learned that a long time ago. I, I told uh, Pat O'Connor told me one time. I told Pat, I said, I'm going to wear these black and white boots and a black and this and that. And Pat says, learn how to work. That's how you're going to make money. And I was right. But uh, Pepper Gomez was fun to work with. Um, Mad Dog Vishal was fun to work with. What, what was your favorite angle, I guess, that you were ever involved with in the WWF? In the WWF? Yeah. Oh, uh, Andre and Hogan. Yeah. Big business. Yeah. Because huh. it was, uh, you could sink your teeth into it. It wasn't like walking around with a rooster. I mean, here you had a, you had, a, had a man. Right. You had something to talk about, you know, and you had, the hottest thing in the business right now was uh, Hogan. And the biggest guy was Andre. And, um, I feel Vince didn't think that I could carry the torch. He wouldn't have put me there, you know. No manager in the business says, I'm the first manager ever in the NWA in St. Louis. First manager in Japan. Um, I did a lot of things no one else ever did. Uh, not because I wanted to, because it just happened. <laughs> but uh, I, I enjoyed what I did. I really did. How was Japan? Full of Japs. <laughs> really? Japs over there. Yeah. As far as like working there, what was it oh, like? It's okay. It's, uh, it's just one month you put in, you're on the bus, and you, you go home. Right, right. Put in your time. Yeah. Now, when the sex scandal broke out, what was the vibe in the locker room in the World Wrestling Federation? The sex scandal with, uh, with WWF? Yeah. And the, the homosexuality and all yeah. that? No one cared. No. It's like, what would happen if the word got out in the record industry as someone smoked dope? Huh. I mean, it's just another story, another thing. You didn't care about it. Right. All, all everybody wanted to do was go home. All they wanted to do was get their checks and go home. They were so tired of traveling. Every building looked the same. Every airport looked the same. You'd work 10 days, you were off 3. You'd work 4, you were off 3, you worked 10. Now, I didn't, because some of those days, I had three days off, I had to go to Baltimore and do prime time. Right, right. Or some guys would have to do personal appearances, so you didn't always get that time off. Did you ever do TNT? The show TNT was Oh, yeah. Okay. With Vince. Uh, Nightheart had uh, 80 some days one time in a row we worked. And uh, I worked in Georgia for the NWA in 79 from February 2nd until Thanksgiving without a day off. How do you cope? You drove. You didn't leave the house till 3 or 4 in the afternoon, so you always had the mornings at home. Right, right. And you were making money. And other than that, what are you going to do? Thoughts on Haku? Haku? Yeah. Class man. Class man. Toughest one, toughest man I've ever met in my life. But he has a real good heart for people. And all he wants to do is just work and feed his family. Did Vince ever do anything, either on camera or in an angle, match, etc., behind the scenes that really upset you? No, he never upset me doing anything. He was, um, <clears throat> he was smooth. He just knew how to handle people. Thoughts on the British Bulldogs? Oh, I thought they were great. I thought they were great. I thought they were the first tag team that really worked as a tag team. You know, you had brother tag teams before, and but these guys, I mean, they just, that spot you never saw with the, the press slams and off the top rope, I thought they were great. I was impressed by them. I, I enjoyed working with them. Thoughts on uh, Randy Savage and Elizabeth? We've heard a lot of stories on the way he treated her and stuff and locking her in. Well, uh, I was I was in broadcasting then, or I was with Andre, so I wasn't with Randy on the road with them. Uh, I'd heard stories that um, he, he kept her locked into a room so the guys wouldn't. Well, you have to do that sometimes because uh, boys will be boys. But then again, you should know if you should maybe bring her around then. So, I don't know. It, it never affected me or anything. Uh, I managed Randy's dad in the early 60s, Angelo Poffo, and um, he was a nice man. Randy's okay. Uh, Liz was just a very nice person and had a, had a role to play. That's how I looked at it. As. I never looked at anybody like, this is a macho man. This is a hulk. This is a rooster. They were people who had a job. That's all. With your uh, heel commentary, with your one-liners and everything, was there ever a time throughout your career where, like, maybe you really insulted somebody and they really took it personally? Yeah. 
Sid Vicious one day came up to me. I said, he's not the sharpest knife. He's not the sharpest fork in the drawer. That would be sharpest knife, wouldn't it? But being the brain, I made it look stupid, saying not the sharpest right. fork. Like uh, the Mikey uh, ship, Sheep Dip, the kid here. <laughs> I call him that because that name will click better than his other name. <laughs> right? Right, right. So Sid came up to me and says, I'm not stupid. Don't talk to, about me like that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then there was another kid uh, named Canyon. He would get in the ring and he'd insult the people. And he'd say, what do you think of me? And they would say, you're the shit, and he'd get mad. Well, I told him that. I said, why don't you get to the ring and compliment everyone? Entertain them. What, what a beautiful what a beautiful looking gown you have on. My, what a nice looking tie and beautiful children. And then when they say they don't like you, then I say, wait a minute. I just told you I liked you. I gave you compliments. And you turned on me. But see, that's when you take a guy on the lowest level of the business and try to put him in a main event level. He wasn't ready. And I told him that. I said, try this. He said, I'll, I'll maybe try it at a spot show. So where is he now? Some guys will never make money, and some guys will. Jake Roberts. Your thoughts on Jake? Jake Roberts was a, a tremendously talented man. But he had a lot of mental problems. He had a lot of uh, emotional problems in his life. But uh, interview-wise, I could when I was producing interviews, I could leave Jake in a room alone and do a weekend interview with him and DiBiase. Hmm. Never have to worry about them. They would get everything on the money. Right. Yeah. Um, did you see Beyond the Mat? No. The movie? Okay. I was going to no. ask you about that. Okay. I've never, I've never read a wrestling book or watched a wrestling movie or anything like that because... Uh, I think everybody's out there to knock us, and I don't. I don't need to be made a fool if I can do that myself. <laughs> um, you also managed Tully and Arn, mm -hmm. Brainbusters. What was that like? Arn's a great guy. Tully just got a a personality problem. I like Tully though, but uh, I know his dad real well. Joe and I were very good friends. Tully just uh, he had a, he had problems with, with people. He had a personality problem. It's okay. Did you and Vince leave on good terms? Yeah. Yeah. I left there. I My contract was up. I was just tired of going to New York. I was just tired of traveling. And my daughter was going to University of Alabama at that time, and I was living in Florida. So I had a chance. I was just going to take off a year and do nothing. I just wanted to take off a year. I was tired after 30-some years. And WCW called me and made me an offer, so I took it. The only reason I did was to be closer to my kid. That's all. Had nothing to do with WWF. I mean, WWF was here. WCW was. Right. I mean, it's like playing T-ball to the Yankees. <laughs> I mean, there was no comparison. It was a, a poor, very poorly run company. I guess, how were you initially approached by WCW? Uh, I was home, and I got called to do the Sunday night show. Eric Bischoff called me. I said, sure. So I came in. He gave me an offer. One price to do one show, and then when Jesse uh, quit, I started doing Jesse's stuff. So he gave me a raise to do that. He gave me three raises, so I, was, I, I had no trouble with Eric. He wasn't the brightest guy when it comes to wrestling, but he gave me three raises. So <laughs> he said, "Okay." <laughs> what are your initial? I guess what were your initial thoughts of uh, Eric Bischoff as, as a person and stuff? Eric Bischoff was a used car salesman that just happened to be involved in wrestling. How would you compare him and Vince? Or is, oh, there, is there no comparison? Walmart, Neiman Marcus. <laughs> I mean, there's there's no comparison. There really isn't. First of all, whoever made the decision, whoever came up with the idea to beat Goldberg, that was bad. Yeah. But whoever okayed it, that was worse. Hmm. Whether it's Eric's fault, whether it's Dr. Harvey Shower's, or whoever it was, that's what killed the wrestling business. He was the next big thing, they didn't even realize it. He, Mark McGuire is a good friend of mine, and Mark McGuire came to Atlanta, and he wanted to meet Goldberg, because he, Mark likes to work out. So McGuire was at the, the ballpark. Right. Goldberg went over to meet him. McGuire ripped his shirt off, 
and rubbed his bat on his chest and went on his 70 home runs. We had no one from our company there to film it. Vince would have had McGuire at Louisville picking out the wood and the bat. Right. He'd have had McGuire getting dressed. He'd have had Goldberg putting on a t-shirt, getting ready. Vince would have produced it. Walmart. I think one of the big problems with WCW is there was no guy that came from a wrestling background. Other there was no money. The there was no money that came out of their pockets. Vince is a wrestling company that needs TV to survive. WCW was a wrestling company that just happened to have us on. Eric Bischoff's money was not, that was Turner's money. Ted didn't care. Vince's money is Vince's money. When I pay you for something, you better do it. They were giving guys money that you couldn't even believe. Guys that shouldn't, shouldn't have made 50 cents were making a half a million dollars. Um, it just, I mean, fans could see it. It didn't work. It was ridiculous. They never followed up an angle. They never did anything. They would do something and then let it lay. Never. What were you thinking the night that everything went down between you and uh, Brian Pillman at the Clash of Champions? That was an accident. See, when you do TV, you can't look into the ring. You have to watch a monitor. Right. So I'm watching a monitor. I don't know Pelman. Never met him. He walked behind me and pulled my coat down around my shoulders. Just playing. Right. But I had, had neck damage. And I, I thought it was a fan <laughs> coming and right. grabbing me. So I yelled, what the? Right. But I didn't know it was Pillman. Wrestlers are dumb. They think... Go mess with the announcers, because they're on camera all the time. Don't they ever watch the show? We're only on camera, maybe at the beginning, maybe at the end. WCW never put us on that much. They didn't know how. They were stupid. Let's open up as we're getting out of limos. Everybody gets out of a limo today. When you open up like that, you think, have I missed something? You've got to start the show. You've got to tell who the announcers are. What's coming up? What you're going to see? Make it exciting. That's how I feel. WCW just, um, it, was a, it was a television production that had nobody in charge that knew what they were doing. It was pitiful to watch. Thoughts and Tony Schiavone was the worst. Because oh. he didn't like the fans, he didn't like the wrestlers, and he wouldn't tell Mike Tanay and I anything about what was going on. His secret to life was, knowledge is power. So he felt if he, he, felt if he knew something, he was more powerful than us. Big deal, you know this guy's going over. Who cares? And sometimes they would want, they wouldn't tell us what was going on. They said we want it to be like a shoot. Well, how would you react? So I told them, I said I wouldn't say nothing, because we've never seen one. It don't happen. It's entertainment business. They, they never could understand that. They could not understand that. They also put you with Steve McMichael, I believe. C. McMichaels was up for an Emmy Award um, when he was doing... Anybody can be up for an Emmy Award. They, they, they pick like 30 people, but only like four go for it. But he was in a different level when he was doing the television or radio for the Chicago Bears. And he was a Super Bowl uh, champion, all that. And Eric Bischoff just fell in love with the guy because of who he was. But Bobby Heenan cannot do hockey. I can't even say the names. Look at the eye charts. I can't do football. I can only do wrestling. McMichaels can do football. He can't do wrestling. Some guys just can't do certain things. Madden. Madden can't do wrestling. But they liked him. They wanted a younger and more MTV look. So that's why they took me off and put Madden on. That's a good look. <laughs>
And I saw you recently, and you were perfectly all right. No, let me explain what happened. Came down to watch the matches. Now, as I did that, I fell and hit my knee on the step. I've had it checked, and I just can't wrestle the night. Now, I came out here for one purpose. That's to show the people and everybody that I have good intentions. That I wanted to beat this farmer, this hayseed hillbilly. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the scheduled match is Pretty Boy Bobby Heenan against Cowboy Bob Ellis. I wanted to wrestle him. I'm perfectly capable of wrestling him right now, but they won't let me wrestle. As you see, I have a brace on my leg. As iron supports, I'm on a crutch. I don't know how long I'll be on the crutch, but I would like right now to have a postponement. Maybe in the next couple months, maybe five or six months, then my knee will be ready, just like Lance's will hurt, and I'll be able to wrestle. I am able to wrestle. I, I just, He's mad enough to come up here and ask like a gentleman that he is. That's more than a lot of people have shown. I just ask a little consideration at all. Bob, I think he's trying to edge his way out of the match. Well, I don't know, but his stud was all right, just not too long ago. Yes, I, uh, you're right there. No, like I said, I fell on the step. I hurt my leg. Would you check and see if it would be okay if they could postpone this for a couple months, maybe five or six months? If you sign for this match, then you got to go through it. He's no, no, wait, no, gentlemen, wait. He's about this, no, he's got a hurt knee. I realize, I realize, I realize I signed for this. Fans, I, I, I don't know what to say. I realize, referee, you can't send him in there with a bad leg like that. You can't send me Well, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know how, what, what the outcome of this will be. Bob, Bobby Heenan has entered the ring with a crutch, claims that he cannot wrestle. Bob Ellis is ready. With Heenan are Lanza and Mulligan. And there's a big argument going on in the ring. We saw Heenan not too long ago and he was all right, but you heard his explanation. are sanctioned by the State Athletic Commission, which has appointed as your referee, Henry Van Loon, the timekeeper, Harry Black. This match has a 15-minute time limit, one fall to a finish. Introducing at a weight of 252 pounds from San Angelo, Texas, the great cowboy, Bob Ellis. And his opponent for this match at 232 pounds from Beverly Hills, California, the one and only pretty boy, Bobby Heenan. Well, fans, I don't know how we can have this match because Heenan just claims he absolutely cannot wrestle. And uh, the referee doesn't believe him. Anyway, Lanza and Mulligan. Oh, Bobby Heenan ran at Ellis and attempted to hit him with the crutch. Ellis ducked. And now, oh, look at it, Cowboy Bob Ellis. <laughs> Ellis is working over Lance on Mulligan. And Heenan is, oh, there it goes, the Bulldog headlock. He has laid out Lance, and now he's working on Mulligan. Heenan is making himself scarce. He drops Mulligan. Hey, now he's chasing him. Now he's chasing Heenan. Lanza and Mulligan are out cold as a result of the Bulldog headlock. And Heenan is taking off. The man is crazy! Two, three! The man is crazy! The man's insane! You think I'm getting with him? Hey, the man's insane! The referee is counting Heenan. The man's a lunatic! Heenan is on the outside. To kill me! Ladies and gentlemen, the match is over. You've been counted out. Count and out. the winner is Bob Ellis. Count it out. Fans, here he is, Cowboy Bob Ellis. Well, Bob, he tried to hit you with that crutch. Sure and boy, you really moved fast and got away. And fans, here, laying on the mat. They're on the mat right now. Lanza and Mulligan are still just about out as a result.